Well, how should I use my uh, 10 to 15 minutes? Uh, I thought I start from a kind of uh, theoretical venture point and uh, towards the end uh, move to some policy mm -hmm. issues though. Uh, when I, I, I saw the um, heading uh, talking about global governance, deglobalization, and the role of our two regions, no? East Asia we are interested in and uh, the EU, uh, I thought um, maybe we should uh, start with what is the problem of globalization or gl deglobalization. And what I find particularly helpful is uh, the notion that uh, the American economist or Turkey-born American economist Dani Rodrik uh, used and uh, with which he made a big splash several years ago when he talked uh, about we don't actually need what he calls hyper-globalization because it creates problems and uh, we definitely don't need deglobalization because it's too costly in terms of effectiveness we need smart globalization. And why do we need smart globalization? Um, well, he says because we have a trilemma tri between three objectives we face on the global level. Uh, one is the issue of globalization and reaping the profits of a more effective, uh, a better allocation of resources through free trade, through free, free flow of capital and so on. On the other side, uh, or the second part of the triangle, that's national uh, economic policy sovereignty over issues we find important on uh, national level, like issues of uh, social policy. What happens to those who are unemployed because of globalization? And then thirdly, there's the challenge of uh, democracy. Who makes these kind of decisions? Are we actually legitimized uh, to make policy decisions? So this is a triangle, and what he says, and I think uh, it's worthwhile to read his uh, 2012 book on that, is that we cannot reach these uh, three objectives at the same time. We have to make compromises, and these compromises have to be smart, and they are difficult. Now, second point is, uh, we are interested in regions. Uh, what does Dani Rodrik say about regions? Well, actually very little, almost nothing. Uh, he talks about uh, the role of nation states in the global uh, system. So we have to come up with our own ideas. And I think there are two ways uh, regions can play a role. One, uh, they form alliances uh, and they get active on the global level, for instance, in formats like uh, G20 or, or other formats. Uh, maybe um, most of the uh, discussions we're going to have these day will focus on this kind of uh, perspective. And I think that's also what Chada Dis Islam, uh, if I understood her correctly, was uh, talking uh, about mostly you know, how can uh, Europe uh, and maybe in alliance with uh, East Asia be effective on that level. Well, as an economist, uh, I'm rather pessimistic that this works. I would love to share uh, you know, the optimism and, and, and the hope, um, but uh, as an economist, uh, you know, what is global governance like? And here I make, would like to make another theoretical point. It's producing a public good. Uh, economists love to talk about public goods. P a public good is something that is very difficult to create because it serves everybody. It's also hard to exclude someone from global governance. So who should have an incentive to create it? To bear the cost of doing it and maybe also bear the disadvantages of trying to influence others. That's extremely hard. And usually it works best if you have what is in theory called a hegemon, a benevolent hegemon, who takes the lead, tries to create some advantages for his or her own, and at the same time create legit legitimacy for leadership through providing these kind of public goods. And we don't have it anymore. I mean, that's the basic problem. Uh, it's about Trump, but we also saw this before happening. Uh, you know, even if uh, 
maybe we have a much more positive emotional feeling about Mr. Obama. You know, let's face it, in terms of creating uh, public goods on a global level, he was not successful. Uh, so this is a long-term development. We are in a post, what is sometimes called post-hegemonic era. Um, so this doesn't work. Would a stable uh, alliance may be able to overcome it so we don't have one hegemon, but we have a stable alliance of actors that move the global agenda into a certain direction? Well, I'm pessimistic. I mean, even for Europe, you know, if you call Europe an alliance, uh, we know this is hard. Europe and East Asia, a stable alliance to move G20 forward? Well, as a political economist, I find this hard, extremely hard. And let me make just, you know, in this mention Japan in this context, I mean, on the East Asian side, Japan would be a, an important uh, a partner uh, for such a kind of alliance. But Japan these days has very little wriggle way uh, in order to make its policies um, uh, effective uh, because in a way they are a little bit in a corner, you know, they are in a very difficult regional situation. Uh, the situation with uh, China is difficult. The role of North Korea is disastrous. Um, so uh, what Japan needs is a kind of stable security alliance with the U.S. And, and almost everything uh, that Japan has done in recent months, you know, the famous visits of Prime Minister Abe in, in New York, can only be understood at, on this background. Uh, to follow different uh, uh, agendas, uh, I think for, for Japan is, is uh, hard these days. So, is there a different role for regions apart from building alliances on a global level for global public goods. Well, yes, I think there is. Um, and this is to create regional public goods. And I think this is what is uh, currently actually happening. And uh, this uh, may be uh, the most active part uh, we see on a global level. Um, that particularly in East Asia, we see these kind of movements to create new institutional mechanisms with uh, the One Belt, One Road or the Belt and Road Initiative, so OBO or BRI, whatever you like to call it, uh, being the most talked about mechanism that really seems to be moving somewhere uh, currently. Now, why is that so and why is it important for global governance? Um, I think it's serious, whereas a lot of what is happening on the global level is, for an economist, cheap talk. But it's serious on the global level. I think we see this. Japan was very hesitant uh, about it because it started from China. Let's face it, that was the major reason. Uh, but these days, a few days ago, actually Prime Minister Abe made public statement that he will be willing with his government to join the Ober Initiative to be part of the uh, Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, AIIB, uh, that is a major instrument uh, uh, of that initiative. So even Japan is, is moving along. Why is that so? Well, I think it is about leadership again. It's a strategy, in my eyes, followed by China to reach several objectives at the same time. Make a case for leadership, which is, it's a national perspective to be a diplomatic leader, to have the foreign policy advantages of that. It has economic advantages, again for China on a national level, uh, because it helps the backward regions uh, of China, uh, for instance, uh, through its infrastructure projects. But at the same time, it can also create advantages on the international level. Let's not forget that. Uh, I mean, we have a lack of infrastructure spending. Already 10 years ago, the Asian Development Bank um, estimated the infrastructure needs of the region until 20 
uh, to the amount of 8 trillion US dollars. Uh, this is an enormous amount, um, and others have not been active uh, to, to fill it. I mean, we know the problems on the global level, the uh, World Bank system. Uh, uh, it's not moving forward. Uh, other initiatives as well, I don't want to go into the details. They are not moving, and uh, in a way, China is creating this kind of public good. Now, okay, so this can be effective, and why would it be meaningful on a global level? Well, we can have learning effects, uh, we can have gestation effects. Uh, so, new parallel mechanisms are used in order to overcome, and now I come back to my initial point, to find a better solution in this kind of strange triangle. No? It's not the Bermuda Triangle, but it's this kind of trilemma of globalization. And we create new points of solutions. They may not be very close to democracy, right? So that is sometimes called a problem, for instance, of the Ober initiatives, that it lays too little stress on uh, how policies, you know, if you cooperate with a Central Asian country, to what extent uh, 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 policies are democratically liberalized. But it may be helpful on the other two sides of the triangle. Couldn't we find a point that is closer to the democracy corner as well? That is my, that is my next uh, and already almost final point. Um, yes, I mean, it's always helpful uh, to find such solutions, uh, but it is not easy. And in that context, let me uh, discuss um, the role of uh, uh, Japan a little bit more. Um, Japan was not too successful uh, in recent years. Uh, to start these kind of regional kind of uh, initiatives. And strangely as it may sound, although Japan is often considered not to be interested in political issues like democracy, I think one of the major reasons why it was not successful in this kind of field of creating such kind of regional public goods was actually that its proposals were too political. and. Um, I think few people know um, what is now considered this kind of Chinese uh, 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 initiative, uh, the Belt and Road. Well, you had something similar 10 years ago from Japan. But it vanished into nothingness. It was, it was called the New Silk Road uh, Initiative. Uh, it was based uh, on diplomatic relations. Um, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was very active, but also, of course, the Ministry of Finance. Uh, they had it all laid out, more or less, um, but um, somehow it vanished. And I think one of the major reasons was that it was too political. It set uh, stringent conditions on uh, democratic processes in the partner countries, and, and that had its origin in the um, situation around 1990, no? when we had the Eastern European, Central Asian uh, countries becoming market economies, leaving uh, the Soviet um, umbrella. Um, and uh, that was the kind of legacy. So Japan put that into the new Silk Road Initiative, and it didn't work. So it's not easy. Uh, but uh, uh, let me sum up, although Japan was not successful, in a way you may say that uh, China learned from that. I'm a little bit oversimplifying history here maybe, uh, but uh, from that is the point of view, uh, China's initiative is a serious one. And I think this would also be something for uh, the EU to learn. This is my, my very final point, uh, for the EU to learn. Um, let's not hope for these kind of alliances on the global level because they cannot be very stable. Rather, look to at these kind of regional initiatives and uh, try to play a role or maybe also create them. 
Um, there are some initiatives that are almost overlooked, and I think that Europe has a strong incentive to support them. For instance, there's an economic initiative in Northeast Asia between China, Japan, and South Korea with a trilateral cooperation secretariat located in Seoul. Uh, this is still a very weak cooperation, um, but it's something that I think Europe has a strong interest to try to work harder on and uh, uh, support it, because this is a kind of new point in this triangle I was talking about. Second, and fi very, really now the final point, uh, European initiatives. I wonder in this audience, has anybody heard the acronym EBRD before. It stands for the Europe, of course the experts know, but hardly anybody else. It stands for European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. It was created around 1990 as a European mechanism to work into the newly uh, freed economies of Eastern Europe uh, up to, to uh, uh, Central Asia to create infrastructure problems. It was a big hope. Uh, in those days, but again, it lost uh, um, uh, power, I think, also to some extent for political reasons. Um, anyway, uh, also on the European level, we have um, initiatives to work on in order to create regional public goods and indirectly make uh, an impact on the global level. And uh, yeah, that's what I would suggest as a policy point to end up with. Thank you very much for your patience.